This is episode 36 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, I let Houdini speak for himself. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 36. It's also day five of Houdini Week 2019. And we've got an interesting program in store for you today. Um, Today, I'm going to let Houdini speak for himself. What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, I have found a couple speeches and some writings of Houdini that I'm going to uh, share with you. I think you'll enjoy them. The first one is an address that Houdini gave before the Club of Odd Volumes in Boston in 1922. Just to give a little bit of background, the uh, Club of Odd Volumes was founded in January 29, 1887, with the following intention. The objects shall be to promote an interest in and a love of whatever will tend to make literature attractive as given in the form of printed and illustrated volumes to mutually assist in making researches and collections of first and rare editions and to promote elegance in the production of odd volumes. The term odd, as used in the club's name, is an 18th century usage meaning varied or unmatched. So it was a very interesting club, kind of a historical club, but uh, grounded in literature. And as I said, Houdini spoke before them in 1922. And here is that speech. Mr. President and gentlemen, it is with a full appreciation of the honor which you have seen fit to bestow upon me that I am appearing before you this evening. Not as a public entertainer, which has been my life's vocation, but rather in the nature of a parent's meeting. I have with me some of my dearest children, which I hope will merit your approval. Should I appear to be overly proud of my possessions or somewhat given to boast, please be as charitable in your thoughts as we must be when a proud father tells us of his one and only child in the world to him. However, it would be ridiculous for me to display my wares in competition with those present. Rather, let us feel that we are here to pay homage to our mutual interest. I will therefore in no way attempt to give a learned or set speech. I have prepared some notes for my guidance and may find it necessary to refer to them for the accuracy of my data. Uh, It's not my intention to adhere strictly to any one subject, and I may therefore wander through Russia, China, or Africa in relating how I was able to collect what is recognized as the most complete library under one roof on the subject of magic and magicians. Should you wish to interrupt at any time with a question, I should be most happy to discuss any questions you desire then or after I have concluded. First, I wish to impress upon you that my love of the bibliographic research is not a fad which I have taken up in later years after I had successfully solved the problem of keeping the wolf from the door, but it has been my cornerstone of my life from my earliest years. We have records for five generations that my direct forefathers were students and teachers of the Bible and recognized as among the leading bibliographers of their times. When we lived in Appleton, Wisconsin, there was no library, and I recall when only a child, I used to devour the biblical tales of long ago and the beautiful Talmudic legends in father's own theological collection. In those delightful hours was fostered the intense desire for books, which is keen enough with me even today to allow an old program or rare volume to divert my attention from a business deal. It is my confident belief that in my ardent research for magical data exclusively, I must have overlooked a host of rare and precious Americana while browsing through the bookstalls in the small interior towns of Europe. It is curious indeed to know how... By the merest chance, I acquired so great a number of exceedingly rare programs, playbills, lithographs, and other valuable magical data 
from Henry Evans Evanion. The material in my collection required over 130 years to gather. Evanion's father collected for 40 years. Evanion himself 60 years, and I have been 30 years in it. During the past two decades, I have acquired the valuable libraries of Hagen, Becker, Adrian Plate, Magical Collection of Hiram Steed, Elliot, Robinson, Edwin Fay Rice, Harrington, Young, Alexander Heimberger, G.W. Hunter, and a mass of the Davenport Brothers material. I enjoyed the confidence of Ira Erastus Davenport and am in the unique position of knowing the work of those well-known mystifiers. It is not generally known that John Henry Harrison Davenport lies buried in Australia, and it was through visiting the graves of the old-timers that I became acquainted with Ira Erastus Davenport. It seems almost weird to relate that so many of my rivals' collections now rest in my library. For example, Adrian Plates, Robinson, and others above mentioned, uh, I look with a tinge of regret upon those works. For what I thought the envious desire of possession was, in truth, nothing more than the incentive of competition. And with the death of these men also passed the joy of strife. In the hope of unearthing valuable data on great magicians, it has been one of my customs in the past to look up the graves of celebrated conjurers, many of which are in a pitiable state. And among those uh, I have visited are the following. Pignetti in Russia, Breslau in Liverpool, Fox in London, where Nell Gwynn lies buried, Dante, who was accidentally killed in Australia, Herman in Vienna, Signor Blitz, who was buried about a hundred yards from our family plot in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn. Anderson in Aberdeen, Scotland, which I had repaired and put into shape. Bosco, the original, in Dresden, Germany, where I found he had not paid for the perpetual possession of his resting place. And if I am not mistaken, there was a 30 or 40 year lease on it. According to the law, unless the grave was bought, his body would be disinterred and placed with the others who had not paid for the perpetual grave possession fee. For the sake of the old master, I bought the grave and presented it to the SAM. Robert Heller, the greatest pattern magician that ever lived, was buried in Philadelphia, and for ten years I made an absolutely fruitless search to locate his grave, almost giving up the task as hopeless. On one of these pilgrimages, in a last desperate attempt... I passed an old man who was working at the Mount Moriah Cemetery, and to him I confided my request. He remembered distinctly, he said, burying someone by the name of Heller, whereupon, to my intense joy, he actually led me to the long-looked-for grave. Among some of the extraordinarily rare letters I possess are the following. The letter of John Henry Anderson, in which he asks his son how the Davenport brothers worked. Houdin, Dobler, Philippe, the one-time celebrated necromancer to whom is given the credit of the lottery or gift show. It was by mere chance that I met his son in Paris, just when it seemed impossible to obtain any news of Philippe, and it was he who sold me some of his father's rare letters. Another gem is a letter from Bautier de Colta, the greatest in- inventive magician that ever lived, who originated, among other things, the vanishing bird in cage trick, causing the bird in cage to vanish in full view of the audience, the flower trick, and the production of flags, and more. However, all that remains of de Colta, the brilliant inventor who was, well, who has been deservedly conceded a prominent place in the shining constellation of magical stars, lies molding in a sadly neglected grave, which I visited on my last tour through Europe six months ago. At the same time, I made an attempt to locate the burial ground of Robinson, known as Chung Ling Su, imitator of Ching Ling Fu, the great Chinese magician, who was shot and killed while performing the bullet-catching trick, which has proven fatal to quite a number of magicians. Buck had the side of his face cut off. Epstein was shot through the lung with a ramrod. Dolinsky killed his wife, and two or three other magicians of minor standing were killed outright. 
Astley, the circus man, claims to have invented the experiment, but I have discovered that the bullet-catching trick was recorded years before his time. Alexander Herman improved on the gun trick by using a Winchester rifle. I had a rather unique experience performing this feat. It was customary for me to present this with a large horse pistol, allowing the committee to load it with a marked bullet so that I never really touched the gun. There was a thick plank on the table leaning against the back wall. The committee were given the option of firing at the board, which would be smashed into splinters, or at me. However, I exacted the promise that once having announced their decision, they would not, on their word of honor, change their minds. For the infinitesimal fraction of a second, there would be an awe-inspiring and breathless silence after the resounding crash of the bullet had made havoc of the plank, which brought home to the committee the seriousness of their decision, had I been chosen as the target. The effect of the illusion showed the miraculous appearance of the bullet between my teeth after having smashed the plate which I held in my hands. Never once in all my experience has the committee failed to fire at the board first. In my filing cabinets, I have some of the rarest and oldest programs on the history of magic, such as Delinsky's, which seems to be the only one extant. This was given to me by Herr Alexander Heimberger, a contemporary of Houdin, Philippe, and Delinsky. His collection of programs, now in my library, are worth their weight in radium to me. In my travels, I advertised in the newspapers for books on conjuring, also uh, sent form letters to all the book dealers. In this way, I was able to pick up hundreds of precious volumes, as, for instance, I received a reply from Wiley of Stuttgart, which resulted in me buying his entire stock. In London, I met a collector who had been buying old newspapers for 25 years. I bought them all and hired an express wagon to deliver his collection to me. Another time, I bought from Mr. Homans, representing the Strobridge Lithography Company of Cincinnati, at least four tons of lithographs of old-timers of the theater. They run from the smallest size to the great big billboard-sized lithographs. And then there's an editor's note here that says, Attached to Houdini's manuscript was a table giving a list of the books, photographs, and playbills packed for Boston, which he was to show to the members of the club. Among the items uh, that was listed was Heller's heel. Houdini amplified this with the following note. When Heller died, the undertaker could not get him into the coffin until he had taken the heels off of Heller's pumps. I met the undertaker in Philadelphia, and he presented one of the heels to me. And that, my friends, is Houdini's address before the Odd Volumes Club in Boston in 1922. And I hope you've enjoyed that, but don't go anywhere because I have another uh, piece on Houdini that I would like to read to you now. This one appeared in uh, the newspaper on uh, November 7th, 1926, so only a week or so after Houdini had passed away. The headline reads, Houdini gave advice to modern youth battling for success. Under that it says, Article written before Death of Great Magician tells how he rose to leadership in his field despite many obstacles. The following article was written by Houdini just before he died probably represents his last written words to the public which he loved. In this article, furnished exclusively by Universal Service, the great magician tells how he rose to leadership in his field despite many obstacles and he gives advice to modern youth battling for success. New York, November 6th. It is true, most unfortunately, that experience is a hard school, but we must all learn it and no other. The light of another's experience will not illuminate the path of youth very much. It is only after he has had his own hard knocks that he can profit from them. Starting out 30 years ago as a magician, I have passed hundreds who did not know that success was just another name for hard work. Those in the arrogance of their youth rarely listen to their elders. Nevertheless, I say that inspiration plays little part in success, and chance plays even less. What little success I may have had has come from making up my mind in my early youth to be the best in my line, no matter what it cost in hard work, and never deviate from that course. People often commend me for my courage, 
often say, indeed, that I am a performer of miracles of courage. That is far from true. I do nothing anyone else could do and do with equal practice and years of toil. When I train to jump from a high bridge, don't think that I jump from the greatest height all at once. It is all by gradual stages. I get a ladder and each day jump from one rung higher than the day before. When I scale the seven story building in a certain motion picture. I started by climbing up one story and coming down, then two and coming down, etc. Till I had gone the full seven. This is the secret of getting to the top in anything. It is the same with training underwater. I started by holding my breath 10 seconds, increasing it gradually in a swimming tank until eventually I could remain under for two minutes. When I was half my present age, I did four minutes in a tank. Many scientists and students of psychic phenomenon say that I have supernatural power. This is obviously absurd. No one possesses supernatural power. No supernatural power is manifested in this world. Do not, therefore, be superstitious. Don't be afraid of spirits or spooks. There are none. Don't dash by graveyards. Don't fear the dark. I have slept in haunted houses and cemeteries, and the only thing I ever caught was a cold. And that's some advice on success from Houdini. Now, I have one more thing I want to share with you that I um, I really like, and I'm only going to share part of this. This is uh, from Houdini's brother, Hardin, and he's talking about Houdini and their early life. And I just found this to be a, a charming little piece, and it goes like this. It was in Milwaukee. We were kids. Harry was not more than nine years old, and I was a couple years younger. He was aiding the family by shining shoes, and I was selling newspapers. Harry had already shown signs of wanderlust, so my job was to make certain that our joint earnings reached home safely, and also, so far uh, as we were concerned, to see that Harry got home. One night, we had accumulated between us something more than two dollars. I put the money in my overcoat pocket, and we caught a ride home on a sled. And upon arrival at home, it became clear that I had not deserved the confidence placed in me because I had lost the money. The family needed the money and needed it badly. My mother did not rebuke me, but she was not far from tears. I didn't know what to do, but Harry's plan to repair the damage was promptly formed. He took me by the hand and led me out of the house to a neighborhood florist shop. There he purchased a flower for five cents, which was all the money we had. A few moments later, he sold it for a dime. We went back to the florist shop, and he bought two more flowers. He sold one of these, and I sold the other. With the proceeds, we bought more flowers. We returned home late that night, but we were able to hand mother a sum equal to the amount we had lost. I never hear anybody comment on Harry's resourcefulness without thinking of a way in which that nine-year-old boy was able to turn defeat into victory. That's pretty amazing. That is a really great story from uh, Theodore Hardeen about he and his brother Harry. And uh, so that is going to be it for day Five of Houdini Week. I hope you've enjoyed this little look into the life of Houdini. I hope you've enjoyed all the uh, episodes this week. I've tried to pick things that were a little less common, but yet very interesting as well. So, hope, like I said, I hope you've enjoyed them. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. I will be back hopefully next week with uh, a regular episode of the Magic Detective podcast. Until then, have a great week.